I think from these rough cut clips, you can see why we're so excited. And to Peter and to Hank and Dan Perot and to all the other people who are working on this film, just a great uh, thanks uh, to you for your dedication to seeing this through. Uh, this is going to be a, a hell of a film. Thank you. While the stage is being set for our panelists in the, the last part of our program this evening, uh, I want to tell you a little story. I had the privilege of uh, conducting a few interviews with President Ford at his home in Beaver Creek in August of 2005. And uh, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, and even at that point, he was loving talking about football and uh, University of Michigan's chances in the upcoming football season. But it, after, uh, after the uh, third conversation, uh, it occurred to me to just ask him point blank, what's the most important leadership trait in a president? And without hesitation, he said, trust. He said, the Republicans had to trust me so that I could lead, help lead the party. The Democrats had to trust me so that I could help lead the Congress, and the American people had to trust me so that I could help lead the nation. He added, when it comes to trust, a leader is either on solid rock or shifting sands, and you can't get traction on sand. Well, I think that that just about sums up what we're trying to do with this conference on, on character and the presidency, and specifically as it applies to Gerald R. Ford. I now have the privilege of introducing a, the moderator of this evening's panel, uh, Victoria Valetic. Victoria is a great friend and colleague uh, of mine personally and of the Howenstein Center. She teaches ethics and legal studies at Western Michigan University's Cooley Law School. And Victoria will be leading the six panelists, uh, asking them to come forward. And uh, she will ask them to introduce themselves, and we'll go from there. Please join me in welcoming Victoria. Thank you. Good evening. Well, two wonderful excursions uh, so far this evening, and we're in for a third. So I'd ask my panelists to please come up, uh, and because we are in for a treat to hear their insights, their anecdotes, and their thoughts on this very important subject of character in the presidency. And if you'll pardon me, I'm going to be sitting. I've acquired a new need recently, so <laughs> it's not quite up to speed. So our panelists tonight are Dr. Hendrik Borum, Dr. Tom Cronin, Dr. Kevin Dendolk, Dr. Jason Duncan, and Dr. Donald Zinman, and uh, Mr. Mike Press. So why don't we start at the end of the table with uh, Dr. Dendolk, if you'd okay. please uh, introduce yourself and give us a, a highlight. What has struck you tonight? What would you like to share? Yeah, so I'm Kevin Dendolk. I'm the executive director of the Henry Institute um, here in Grand Rapids. It just dawned on me and when I said that, of course, the namesake is Paul Henry, um, who uh, occupied uh, the same seat. Um, Ford. Um, my uh, role here really is to talk a little bit about um, the role that uh, religion might play um, in shaping uh, presidential character. Um, but I have to say, and would you like me just to go ahead and, and dive in with some observations? Um, I have to say that's a little bit of a fraught exercise. Gleaves asked me to do that, and not only because those are two topics that you're really not supposed to talk about in polite company, um, religion <laughs> and politics, um, but also because it's very hard, uh, in fact, just exploring um, Jerry Ford's legacy a little bit uh, over the last couple of days been interesting to see how he talked about his own religion and how reticent he was um, to really uh, suggest that that um, shaped uh, character in, in a variety of ways. So um, as a political scientist, what I can say about the role that um, religion plays in, in um, this interplay of, of uh, character um, in presidential politics has a lot more to, to do with how the mass public um, perceives it. 
Um, and so we know a whole lot more about how ordinary citizens um, understand or how they perceive um, the relationship of religion um, and presidential character than we know about the actual effects of religion on presidential character. Um, and so when we ask people um, in surveys and so forth uh, questions about this relationship um, between faith and um, presidential character, first of all, there's a whole lot of circumstantial evidence that um, the American public do make a connection um, between the religious faith of a president and the character um, of the president. Um, and that's why the public um, demands, the mass public, um, tends to demand its leader in the highest office be religious. This is one of the reasons why um, the mass public demands that the uh, president be religious. So despite its pro prohibition in the Constitution, um, we do in practice, in practice, um, in the United States have tests for presidential office, religious tests um, for um, presidential office. And indeed the public has a hierarchy of religious preferences, um, what kind of religion uh, matters, but most importantly um, to the American public, it matters that presidents are religious. Um, there's some partisan explanations for that. It is true that Republicans are less likely um, than a Democrat uh, than Democrats to see a Democratic candidate as religious, and vice versa. But we know um, that religion also has an independent effect. Um, we know this because we can see that um, when we ask people about their support uh, for diff different religious uh, candidates within their own party, they'll often say, that, well, I have greater support um, for this candidate within my party because of his uh, or her um, religious identity um, and not for this other um, set of candidates. So the upshot um, is that elected officials um, presidential candidates, candidates um, included, know that the public cares about their religion, and so they have an incentive. Uh, they have an incentive, those candidates um, and those public officials have an incentive to show the public that they are religious. Um, and so it becomes very difficult for a political scientist like me to disentangle um, a motivation, um, a religious motivation for acting in the world um, um, from perhaps some political calculation. This is a long-winded way of getting to the point about Jerry Ford. What's interesting to me um, in thinking about Ford is the extent to which, despite, he, despite the fact that he would have that incentive um, to show this kind of public religiosity, um, that he didn't, relatively speaking. Um, that he didn't, as he um, said, and lots of uh, people who have commented, uh, friends of his and so forth, would say, he didn't wear his religious faith um, on his sleeve. Um, it was real, yet largely private. Um, it's important to note that that claim, that it was real yet largely private, um, is a relative claim. Um, so we know that his immediate predecessor um, used religion quite strategically. Um, and most of his successors, Carter, um, Reagan, George W. Bush, um, and most of all probably Clinton, I'm, I'd be happy to talk with you about that later, um, connected their decisions to religion all the time um, and did that very explicitly, very publicly. Um, Ford, here's one thing, I'm uh, looking at some research on this. Ford was the least likely, for example, of all modern presidents, and this goes back to Roosevelt, of all mar modern president, presidents to invoke religious imagery um, in high state addresses, State of the Union address, other addresses of that sort. Um, so President Ford can, can seem less religious simply because his peers appear to be more religious. Um, so that's one thing, it's a relative claim. But beyond that, um, I think it's also a reflection of his own self-identity. By all accounts, he was attached to the Episcopalianism of his youth, um, with, a, with a little bit of late 1970s evangelicalism thrown in there, I think. Um, but um, religion, and religion mattered to him, it mattered to him ex, ex, what social uh, psychologists would say extrinsically, and because he was a joiner, so you've heard that tonight. It was interesting to hear the, you know, the references to uh, being in the Eagle Scouts and other kinds of groups. Well, that's also uh, the case with church membership, um, his, his role um, in the church. Um, he was, in a sense, taught, socialized um, to be a joiner. Um, and so church membership was among this range of affiliations that it, he had. 
Um, I think it also mattered to him intrinsically. It gave him focus and resolve, um, meaning, uh, meaning in, in tragedy even. Uh, but he rarely, if ever, um, seemed to use it, didn't seem to matter, or religion didn't seem to matter in a conventional political way. Um, at least in the sense of mobilizing support by touting um, religion as an indicator of moral uprightness. Um, I think that, that would have, um, and he would talk about that as, as mortifying him in some way to think about religion in those terms. I think there are lots of reasons for his hes hesitancy to uh, bring faith in, into public life in, the w in, in ways that other um, presidents have. Um, some of it was about the context of the time and the changing uh, context in presidential politics. Some of it was personal, and perhaps we could talk about that in question and answer. Um, but I think one reason just has to do with his healthy view of the rough and tumble of politics. Um, to bring a weighty thing, a, a, a weighty thing um, like religion, um, into the political mix was just too volatile, um, maybe even impractical. Still, we have um, some examples, and I just wanted to close, and I, I um, copied this down. This was from his, his statement. Um, we just saw a clip of it. Um, from his statement uh, when he um, pardoned uh, Richard Nixon. And he said this, The Constitution is the supreme law of our land, and it governs our actions as citizens. Only the laws of God, we haven't forget the language of God, the religious imagery, in this um, high state um, statement. Um, only the laws of God which govern our consciences, our consciences are superior to it. Theirs, meaning the Nixon family, is, about, is an American tragedy, and someone must write an end to it. I've concluded that only I can do that. And if I can, I must. As a man, my first consideration will always be uh, to be true to my own convictions and my own conscience. I do believe with all my heart and mind and spirit that I, not as a president, but as a humble, humble servant of God, will receive justice without mercy if I fail to show mercy. Now you can interpret that religious imagery here as an effort to uh, pre preempt some recriminations, uh, but I generally would give the benefit of the doubt here and say, look, um, this is an example um, where the use of religion is really an exception that proves the rule. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Maybe we can talk about Great. That thank more. you. Dr. Zinman. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Donald Zinman. I'm a professor of political science um, here at Grand Valley State University. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I wanted to say a few words in my time about uh, presidents and making unpopular decisions. Because uh, we've already touched upon this quite a bit this evening. Um, we'll start with pardons. Uh, in the nature of the presidential pardon. The pardon is not meant to be popular. You think of, obviously, Gerald Ford's pardon. I don't need to rehash that. Or, for that matter, Jimmy Carter's uh, blanket pardon of Vietnam War draft evaders. That was terribly unpopular uh, and polarizing at the time it was, it was done. Or uh, Andrew Johnson's uh, many pardons of uh, former Confederates uh, after the, uh, the Civil War. And you look at the, at the presidential pardon, today, of course, uh, American presidents are notoriously stingier uh, and much more parsimonious with their use of the pardon than they used to be. Um, and American presidents today fear political consequences uh, or perhaps out of fear that their legacy could somehow be smudged, even if it's a, a pardon that uh, they're being asked to issue on their way out of the Oval Office. Presidents continue to be very stingy uh, with the use of, of the pardon. Presidents worry about uh, uh, pardoning somebody and then that person years later turning around and, and committing new crimes, which would then embarrass the president who pardoned that person. The pardon is fascinating, though, because it's one of the few presidential powers that is absolute. It's almost king-like. It's not subject to being overturned by other actors in, in government. It is an awesome power of, of the president's presidency. And the framers of the Constitution, uh, they put this provision in, in the document for a lot of reasons to check the worst excesses or miscarriages of justice that may occur politically motivated prosecutions or moments of public hysteria that are bound to infect citizen juries that 
can sometimes lead juries to disregard principles of justice. Now that, of course, is not what we get with Mr. Nixon and, and Watergate. Uh, with Mr. Nixon and Watergate, Ford made a decision that the welfare of the country dictated that this whole sorry episode be closed with a pardon. That the pardon can also be used for these purposes whereby a, a, a president is putting the best interests of the nation, frankly, ahead of the interests of pursuing what might be well-deserved justice for one person. That the pardon can be used to put a sorry episode for the country behind us. Uh, when George Washington, for example, pardoned the instigators, the leading agitators of the Whiskey Rebellion um, during his presidency. Uh, the welfare of the nation at this point in time demanded uh, a full-time commitment from our president. The, the, the many problems bedeviling the country and, uh, and the world in the mid-1970s demanded a full-time presidency. And Gerald Ford had every right to have, I believe, a, a full-time presidency, as Watergate was not a scandal that involved him. The pardon, fairly or not, attached him to Watergate for, from there on out, and politically he never, of course, fully recovered. But more broadly here, speaking about presidents making unpopular decisions, you know, the framers created this office with the expectation that the American president would be enough of a statesman to be able to resist popular opinion when necessary for the long-term welfare of the country. We all know that popular sentiment in 1974 was very clearly in favor of prosecuting Mr. Nixon. Um, but Ford made a decision that he felt was in the best long-term interest of, of the country. Time and again, I believe, a president's greatest moments come not when they're following the flow of public opinion or majority sentiment, but rather when they're when they're frankly pushing against the tide, sailing against the wind, and defying the transient will of the people towards a better long-run objective when um, Harry Truman fires the insolent General MacArthur uh, and makes a, a terribly unpopular decision in the midst of the Korean War to fire the most popular general in the country. Uh, but to, to preserve the, the important principle of civilian control of the military, and history has absolutely vindicated um, that decision. And in recent years, when, when presidents have had to make unpopular policy decisions, um, whether it, it, it be, as was mentioned earlier this evening, uh, George Bush to uh, make the fiscally responsible decision in 1992 uh, to raise taxes, that uh, from a fiscal standpoint, that proved to absolutely be the right decision that helped lead us to uh, balanced budgets in, in the 1990s. It was a foolish campaign promise that shouldn't have been made, a, a, a campaign promise that was wisely broken, I believe. Um, or um, when a president makes an unpopular decision to bail out the banks, as George W. Bush did, or Barack Obama to, to bail out the, the auto industry. Um, these were presidents of, of various different political persuasions that uh, all uh, made decisions that very much pushed against the current of, of public opinion, and I believe they deserve credit for it. Um, but I'll leave my remarks at that. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Borum. Um, hi, I'm Hendrick Borum. Uh, I taught for many years at Bucks County Community College in uh, Newtown, Pennsylvania. Retired a couple of years ago and I moved to South Carolina. Uh, the, uh, you won't hear anything about the Ford presidency from me because I don't do presidencies. I, you know, I study the lives of presidents um, in an effort to determine how their character developed. And I usually, you know, begin during their school years and go up to something like uh, the early 20s when they're launched into adulthood trying to look at the, uh, the influences that were on them, the choices that they made. I published a book a couple of years ago, some of y'all may have seen it, called Young Jerry Ford. It was for sale at the museum and various other places by Eerdmans. Um, 
lots of uh, lots of photographs and written in an accessible style a, a book to be sold in the museum my you know, my view of, uh, of those matters with Ford but I'm about to publish another version of sort of the same thing this is called the education of Gerald Ford it's uh, also from Erdman's it's going to go on sale in January uh, not so many pictures and a lot of footnotes and this time I'm really trying to kind of uh, nail down the uh, the conclusions and show you where I learned uh, different items. And this one will carry uh, forward through graduation from Ann Arbor uh, in 1935. Uh, that's the area that I've been working on most recently, uh, his uh, four years at Ann Arbor. That's kind of at the top of my mind, so let me just give you a couple of tidbits from what I've uh, learned about there and see if you can extrapolate forward to how they might have created a character or exemplified a character uh, that shows up in his presidency. <coughs> Ford and football. You can't talk about Ford without talking about football. So uh, I'll just give the, the brief history of his career as a football player uh, with the University of Michigan. Uh, he was voted the outstanding freshman uh, at the end of his freshman year, received the Chicago Alumni Trophy, and even 10 years later, he put down and informed that that was the most significant accomplishment of his life. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was really excited because it showed that he could play in the big leagues, um, not just high school where he had done very well. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, in the year, in the class ahead of him, there was a gifted uh, center from uh, Western Michigan named Charles Bernard from Benton Harbor uh, that uh, had one year more experience than he did, and Ford in the next two years almost never got off the bench. There were, uh, in addition, he hurt his knee again uh, during sophomore year and scarcely played at all. A junior year, he played some, but not a great deal. At the end of uh, at the end of the 1933 season, the players that were going on to the next year uh, then got together to elect a captain. They wanted to elect Jerry Ford, who hadn't played a lick basically. Um, it was because they had come to know him. He was sort of the moral center of the team, the one who held. Uh, them all together and, um, and who stimulated them to go back and play. And also, of course, they had had two sensational seasons, winning, um, winning all games but one and one, winning every game in the other. Uh, and then finally in the senior year, Ford turns down the captainship. He said, I didn't play. Uh, let Tom Austin have it. Tom Austin was a guard. Ford was the center. This is kind of significant too. Uh, why? And, you know, I mean, you ask yourself, were there no backs? The question was, you know, the question was answered in the season of 1935 uh, when Michigan lost every game but one. It's on one of the worst seasons in uh, Michigan history. The only one they won was that extremely controversial game with the Georgia Tech that you'll, I'm sorry, I can't talk about it. I haven't got time to talk about it. You'll have to read my book. Uh, but uh, at the time that, uh, at the time that uh, Ford was elected and then turned down the position of, uh, of Captain Harry Kipke, the coach commented to a player, to a uh, newspaper reporter, that if I had 11 men um, with the uh, spirit of Gerald Ford, I could win any game against any team in the country. Um, so, what can I say? His uh, his colleagues on the team uh, thought the world of him, and he ended up holding the team together in this uh, very dismaying 1935 season. Uh, there's more to it, but let me let me go to the other example, which is almost unknown to most people. Ford didn't talk about it very much. Uh, the, other, the other main part of college that was interesting uh, to him was that he joined Delta Kappa Epsilon, the uh, 
uh, a lot of football players uh, belong to this fraternity, uh, which was made up kind of half and half of rich kids uh, and uh, and athletes. They had the reputation for a party house. A party house. When he joined them, they were on probation. In fact, uh, the. Uh, uh, he loved the Deeks. He really did. He developed just a very strong attachment to them. You know, uh, several of his closest friends and advisors in Grand Rapids and the presidency and beyond were uh, members of Delta Cap Epsilon from uh, from Ann Arbor. Uh, so um, one of the actually the longest series of Ford's letters that survives is. There's some letters he wrote to a friend in Grand Rapids in the fall of 1933, just describing his social activities. And it's the Deeks, the Deeks, the Deeks, the Deeks, all the way through. I mean, that was where his, uh, his social life was. Okay, this is the Depression. We're talking about 1932, 33. Ford is on a tight budget, although not as tight as he made it out to be in the uh, uh, in his uh, in his memoirs, because he did not mention that his mother was providing him with several hundred dollars from her own money, and the, re uh, the reason that she was, I think, was because she wanted him to have the fraternity experience. In other words, live up to the rest of uh, the standards of the rest of the guys. And it's true, he learned a lot of social sophistication. Uh, he, you know. He was a very unusual deke. Everybody said that. You know, he didn't get drunk every weekend, but he did learn moderate drinking in the deeks. Uh, and uh, uh, in, um, he, toward his junior year, he suddenly uh, he suddenly realized that he, like many of his brothers, had been uh, paying for many of his expenses, uh, namely his room, on credit. Nothing, uh, nothing wrong with this. A gentleman trusts another ju a gentleman. You know, credit was big in the fraternity world, but hey, the whole depression was about the credit structure collapsing. You know, and uh, that was what happened to the Deeks and Ford uh, in the uh, uh, year of 33-34. Uh, businesses in Ann Arbor started dunning the Deeks for bills that they had left unpaid. Uh, for two and three years, uh, the Deeks panicked and started dun dunning their members. Ford suddenly got hit with a bill for six hundred to one thousand um, dollars. Nobody's really sure how much it was. He told the story three different ways. This was the time that he wrote to his father in Wyoming, his biological father in Wyoming, whom he hadn't seen since that encounter in the uh, restaurant and said, please, please, I'm, you know, I'm on an all-American football team, you know, I'm an honor to the family, all this kind of stuff, please give me some money. Never heard a word back from it. Um, and um, <clears throat> I, eventually, Ralph Conger uh, at Central High was the one who bailed him out, his father's friend, the athletic di director at Central. Uh, but, uh, and oh, and then, at, at, toward the end of his junior year, the, uh, the administration came down hard on the Deeks, and not for drinking, uh, but because their financial uh, situation was such a muddle. They said, basically, a, uh, an organization that can't manage its own finances um, you know, is not something the university <coughs> wants to support. Um, so Ford's reaction is great. He gets himself re uh, elected. He's going into his senior year. Gets himself elected treasurer of the chapter uh, and house manager, uh, which means that he you know watches everybody and collects the uh, the money on time. As ma manager and house, uh, as house manager and treasurer, he mobilizes the brothers. One group goes over and talks to the Detroit alumni and persuades them that the honor of the chapter is really seriously in danger and they had better come over and bail it out. Um, and the, the auto industry was just starting to revive uh, at that time, uh, beginning of 1934, so they said, you yeah, uh, they were talked into it. 
uh, he persuaded the brothers to uh, to establish a uh, a uh, contest for best scholar in the house. Not the, not the guy whose grades improved most from semester to semester would actually get a financial reward. Um, again, trying to get the uh, the chapter indirectly to shape up. Toward the end of nineteen. Um, toward the end of that school year, the beginning of 1935, they published uh, um, a um, profile of Ford in, a, uh, in the student yearbook, and the first thing it said about it was he was the best treasurer that East had had in years. He had single-handedly put the chapter back on its feet. Um, you know, he didn't do it by himself. Um, he organized uh, uh, brothers to do it. Uh, but nevertheless, it is interesting. It's part of this heritage he got from his father and mother, both of them progressives. You see a problem. Uh, if you have the skills, you go after it. He decided he had the skills. He went after it and succeeded. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're running a little short of time. Um, so Dr. Cronin, would you <coughs> introduce yourself in a capstone, please? My name is Tom Cronin, and I'm impressed at the stamina of people here in the Grand Valley uh, <laughs> for being here to celebrate the Grand Valley's favorite son. Uh, one thing's absolutely clear, uh, and just four or five points I'd make, <clears throat> is that uh, Gerald Ford lost the 1976 election, but he did not lose the admiration of the American people. Character, patriotism, and loyalty were his calling cards, and I think everybody, regardless of their party affiliation, regards Gerald Ford is a very special person, and Richard Smith's talk, and the found founders of this documentary, and supporters of this center, um, understand that Gerald Ford cared about the common ground, cared about discovering how you bring people together to achieve common aspirations. And what I, I'm a political scientist, I've written a lot of books on American government and the American presidency. I got to work in the White House for a year, I was in the White House last month, and uh, visiting, and uh, what's clear to me is that Gerald Ford stands out as an example of somebody who gives a good name to politics. And we need politics. Democracy, constitutional democracy, needs groups who get involved and who debate and talk and bargain and compromise, and that's what politics is. It's a substitute for shooting at each other, which they do in so many places around the world. And Gerald Ford a great tribute to this valley was an example of somebody who understand that politics is not for the easily winded. It's not for amateurs and it's not for people who, uh, who uh, are impatient. It's for people who are in there for the long distance run, who have stamina and who care about politics not as an end but as a means to help us develop shared aspirations. Public trust when I was in college and university, which included briefly at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, I'm proud to say, uh, was 75% of the American people trusted the people in Washington to do the right thing all the time or most of the time. Today it's down to 20%. It's been a huge decline of over 50% uh, from 75 to 22% or whatever. And Gerald Ford became president at a tumultuous time right after Vietnam, a loss of a war, as Richard Smith has talked about, and a loss of faith for this country, and a divided country, and then Watergate, and then Agnew, and then, <clears throat> then the, the partner of Richard Nixon, which I, large numbers of people, including myself, thought was a horrible thing at the time. It turned out, most historians and political scientists today, and any knowledgeable student would agree, it was the right thing to do because to be dragged on for two years with indictments and appeals and so on would have been ruinous for this country. But all those things coming hurt him. Here is a guy who was elected by an average of 65% from this district regularly for 12 terms, 12 elections. He came into office, he was 70% approved in his first poll. A month later, it was down to 49%, largely because of that pardon. <clears throat> For the rest of his presidency, he hovered around 45, 50 percent. Uh, and he, he, that was a major factor hurting him. But it wasn't the only factor. The fact that Nixon had lied to him, uh, 
hurt him enormously. The fact that Ronald Reagan campaigned against him in the middle of his presidency hurt him a lot. The fact that there was unemployment <clears throat> around 8 or 9% and inflation at 10 or 11% in 74 and 75 also. The reality is economics affect whoever is in office. It doesn't matter which party you're in. And he inherited a downturn. He made headway on that. He made headway with the Soviets. He accomplished many things, but he didn't get much credit for it when he's having to battle within his own political party. So he had a tough presidency. But what stands out to me is that uh, we have enormously unrealistic, probably unfair expectations we put on American presidents. We want so many virtues and talents, it's almost as if we want God on a good day <laughs> to, be, uh, to be in the presidency. Right. And the reality is, in this country, we are a nation that celebrates individualism and liberty more than we do community and leadership. And it's tough to become president. The American Constitution is written almost as much to be an anti-leadership document as a leadership document. One of my mentors was fond of saying, and I'll repeat it here as a closing remark, <clears throat> Madison, in a way, was too successful. There's so many checks and balances and separation of powers and accountability mechanisms. It's tough to provide leadership, as Joe Ford found out, <clears throat> and as all presidents find out. And my mentor's uh, aphorism is a lengthy sentence. We need Hamiltonian, there's a great play on Broadway, I recommend, by the way, call Hamilton. If you haven't seen it, please see it. Uh, we need Hamiltonian energy in the American presidency in order to make our Madisonian system of separation of powers and checks and balances and uh, shared responsibilities work in such a way as it can achieve just Jeffersonian ends of uh, justice and liberty and freedom for all. And Gerald Ford was just one of many people we have put in this position of saying, lead us but also, we want to have a lot of checks and balances. Anything you're going to do, we're going to, whether it's refugees or pardons, we're going to check and balance you to death. And uh, uh, so he gave politics a good name. Politics is inevitable, necessary, and desirable. And Gerald R. Ford knew that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Duncan. OK, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Glees. I'm Jason Duncan. I teach. American History at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids. And in addressing this question of a politician, I thought, how do we judge character? And then I thought, well, what do, his, what do a politician's colleagues think of them? Uh, what do they, how do they view them? And we have a good example of that which in Gerald Ford's career at the confirmation of the vice presidency in 1973. <clears throat> Just let's go back there for a second. Watergate was in its throes. October of 73, the Saturday Night Massacre. Nixon clearly on the ropes. The man many observers thought would be impeached and removed or resigned within a year or two. Vietnam still happening. The war is still dragging on. Cult countries in great cultural upheaval. Nixon ha has to pick a vice president because his own vice president, we just heard, resigned in corruption not related to Watergate. Technically, it originated in Maryland when he was governor. He was taking bribes as county executive and governor and then as VP, but clearly it didn't make Nixon look good that Agnew resigned unrelated to Watergate. Politically, it was connected. So he has to pick, under the 25th Amendment, ratified just a few years before, in 1967, he had the authority to appoint a vice president and may be confirmed by the House and the Senate. And in a way, and this ranked with a lot of people, including some Democrats, he got to appoint his own. It would seem like he was he'd be appointing his own successor, which did not go over well with a lot of people. But the Constitution clearly gave him that power. He conferred with leaders of both parties on Capitol Hill. The word came back, Gerald Ford. Trusted, respected, I left and right, Democrats, Republicans, after 25 years, nearly, in the House. Confirmation hearings. Democrats would have loved, and probably some Republicans at this point, to sink Nixon <coughs> further by shooting down his vice presidential nominee. Ford, however, was not going to be the person to be defeated. Background check, 350 FBI agents went through his life. 
everything from his golf scorecards to his laundry tickets. I mean, they went deep in his life. And they came up with very, very little. I mean, one minor oversight. I mean, his record was sparkling. The confirmation goes to the House. His former colleagues vote him in, or confirm him, 387 to 35. Most of the 35 who voted no, all the 35 were Democrats. Most were liberal Democrats. Some thought he was too conservative on civil rights, on the economy. And they didn't still, even though the Constitution was clear on this issue, they still didn't like Richard Nixon appointing his own successor. In the Senate, where he was less known, the vote was even better. 92 yes, 3 no. By the way, one of the 92 yeses was Joe Biden, now the vice president, and early in his term in the Senate. Here's what one liberal Democrat said of Congressman Ford, Alan Cranston, a liberal from California. He found himself shocked to be voting for a Republican for vice president. Probably shocked to be voting for a Republican for anything, but much less vice president. He said, I doubt there has ever been a time when integrity has so surpassed ideology and the judging of a man for so high an office in our land. So honesty, respect, trust, trump ideology. Philip Hart, fellow Michigander, a Democrat who knew Ford better than other senators, presumably said this. He disagreed with Ford's voting record. He disagreed with his basic political philosophy. But then he added this, that uh, as a steady, his fellow Michigander would be a steady, decent, and believable chief executive, and those attributes, I believe, are what this nation needs most at this particular moment in history. So when Gerald Ford enters the White House, never elected president, never elected vice president, the only president uh, to that holds, so that's true, never elected to a statewide office, even though he'd been a lifelong politician. His greatest strength, his greatest attribute was his character, his ability to engender respect and trust in a very, very difficult moment in American history. And I think given the totality of his career and the pardon and his presidency and all the rest, it's very important, but that moment gets overlooked sometimes. And I think it really shows what the people who knew him best, even those who voted against him, like Peter Rodino in New Jersey, said, I like him, I trust him, I just think his political views are too different from what the country needs, but nothing personal. So even those who voted no qualified their no vote, many of them with a uh, 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 gesture of support for President Ford. And I think in the ordeals in Watergate and Vietnam, it was essential for the United States in 1973 and 4 to have a leader whose integrity was being approached, and Gerald Ford certainly met the moment. Thank you. Mr. Grass. Uh, my name is Mike Grass. Uh, my claim to fame is that I grew up living next door to Tom and Janet Ford. Uh, Tom Ford was Gerald Ford's half-brother. My best friend was Tom Ford Jr., also known as Skip. And uh, my father was a doctor. And Tom Ford ran the Ford, Ford Paint and Varnish Company. And we often uh, bartered pills for paint. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my claim to fame. Uh, my other claim to fame is I'm a filmmaker and a and I did a film that was on PBS about uh, Gerald Ford called Time and Chance after, based on uh, uh, James Cannon's book. And uh, I wanted to talk tonight briefly, very briefly. I'm not an academic or a scholar. Uh, I'm just a regular guy, uh, kind of off the street, who knows a little bit about Gerald Ford. Uh, some weeks, uh, months ago, years ago, I had lunch with Gleaves, and we talked about um, the pardon of Richard Nixon. And uh, I told him the story of how the, 
the pardon can be is a metaphor for Gerald Ford, for his character certainly, for his moral courage, but it's also a meta metaphor for um, that three men from Grand Rapids were most responsible for the pardon of Richard Nixon, and not too many people are aware of that. And I'm talking about Gerald Ford, who, whom I call the messenger, Phil Buchan, his White House attorney from Grand Rapids, and Duncan Littlefair, uh, Buchan's best friend, uh, and uh, also the historian of Fountain Street Church in Grand Rapids. Uh, but Buchan, uh, you can't tell the story of the pardon without talking about Phil Buchan, whom I call the architect of the pardon. He orchestrated the pardon with Benton Becker. Uh, but he called in, uh, Gerald Ford called in his inner circle of friends and colleagues and staff, uh, Robert Hartman, Jack Marsh, uh, uh, and uh, Henry Kissinger, and Alexander Haig, and Phil Buchan, and asked them if what they thought about him pardoning Richard Nixon, and don't tell anybody, but I'm thinking of pardoning Nixon, and uh, Ford uh, just said this very matter-of-factly, Phil Buchan left the room, went back to his office, and violated the trust that he had with his friend Gerald Ford and called Grand Rapids. Because Ford asked Buchan, could, can I pardon someone who has not yet been convicted of a crime? And Buchan said, I, I, I can't do the research by myself, I need, I need some help. So he brought in Benton Becker, the, uh, an attorney in D.C., and uh, they went about their business in, uh, around Labor Day uh, of 74. And uh, Buchan came back and said, you can, you can uh, pardon uh, Mr. Nixon if you so choose. And he also called in a, a law firm in Grand Rapids and asked them for help. So Grand Rapids is, I don't think you can talk about the character of Gerald Ford without talking about the character of the community of Grand Rapids. Uh, uh, Little Fair, he uh, got into the picture when Phil Buchan, his friend, called Grand Rapids and said, Duncan, can you come to Grand Rapids right away or come to Washington right away? I need to talk to you. And uh, he said, Sure, and he, and, he, and he flew and arrived in Washington the next day. He uh, wrote a speech for, for Buchan to give to Ford, and uh, that speech was later turned into a sermon that he gave a week later at Fountain Street Church called The Pardon of President Nixon. And uh, my point is that uh, the a visit by Little Fair to Washington to talk to Buchan uh, and Buchan talking to Ford was part of the story of this moral courage thing and the development of, of the courage of a president to do the right thing. And uh, that's, that's my story. Great. Thank you. Do we have time for a quick question to follow up on something uh, Richard Norton Smith and Dr. Cronin said, or do we need to wrap up? Would you like to ask it? Oh, I'd love to ask Go it. For it. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> Richard Norton Smith suggested uh, that um, flexibility is the essence of statecraft, and yet Dr. Cronin also identified that tension that politics is for the long game and that we put our presidents in a very tight box. I would ask you, where is the line? Where is the fair line between compromise and necessary compromise and a lack of trust? 
Do you want me to explain it? Yeah. <clears throat> we want presidents to be pro programmatic, but we also want them to be pragmatic. That's part of a dozen major paradoxes of leadership. Uh, and Ev, Ev Dirksen one time said, my, uh, I'm a man of fixed and unbending principles, but my first fixed and unbending principle is to be practical or pragmatic <laughs> at all times. And I think Jerry Ford knew that. There's no, there's no clear line. You have to improvise. Uh, I think leadership is improvising on these kinds of things. Uh, but to have, as several people have already spoken about, to have a compass where you have basic principles, basic values, and Gerald Ford had those. And, uh, but uh, you've got to make tough to, every, every day. Every, and every president makes mistakes. <coughs> he, he made some mistakes. On the economy, he went the wrong way initially, hoping to beat inflation. But he, he improvised and he changed. And he, it, did, <coughs> it served him well to be flexible in order to, uh, and they made headway uh, for the next few years on inflation and unemployment as a result of that. I, I would only add this, that you, you, you phrased that, that, that question in terms of trust. Um, and we sometimes have a model of leadership as the great hero, right? But I think one of the very clear messages from a night like this and from from Ford's life, life story is that part of his um, capacity uh, to be flexible had to do with a very rich network um, that um, had built up over time and, and had built up around trust, right? Um, so flexibility um, and being able to act as a leader required this um, network of trust um, and, and, um, and that is from my perspective as a political scientist looking at a lot of the, the data on um, trends over time, lack of, of social trust, interpersonal trust in our political system um, is a fundamental problem today. Um, so Ford is a, a kind of lesson I think um, for us now about how important trust is to leadership. I'll just say, in you know, to my way of thinking, Ford was not a very flexible kind of person. That's why he was conservative. He believed in uh, in basic principles. He believed in sticking to them. Uh, but he was an athlete, which means he was a competitive person too. He wanted to win. This is one of the oldest you know, dilemmas in the, uh, in the leader's book. If you have principles, how much do you bend them if by bending them you can win, which is what you want to do. Uh, I think that Ford was you know, pretty much on the side of um, not wanting to bend his, uh, his principles, although he did occasionally. But basically, I think his, uh, his uh, lack of flexibility is what, you know, is what we admire about him and and other political figures. Unlike his immediate predecessor, Nixon, nobody knew if Nixon had any principles that he was willing to support. <laughs> yeah, uh, at all. Ford, you always knew where he was. Hmm. Dr. Cronin, any closing remarks? No, uh, <clears throat> just a, a shout out to the wonderful people who have both begun and fund this center here. Uh, uh, this is my first trip to uh, Grand Valley. I've been to Michigan several times, mm -hmm. but uh, what a splendid university, what a splendid center, and this program on the common ground that some, several of you have been supporting. There's a fabulous idea of getting people talking and debating and searching for common aspirations. This country now more than ever needs to talk uh, across party lines and across regional lines and across uh, racial lines uh, to have conversations about what we share in common in this country. And my hat's off to Grand Valley and the, 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 this institute and this center and the Common Ground program. Um, you people are really showing the rest of the country what can be done. So uh, congratulations to everybody here, and particularly the donors who helped make this work. Thank you very much. I had a lengthy handout I was going to give out. Oh, yeah? I chose not to. Uh -huh. Well, we have some dessert for all of you who have stayed in. You've hung in there. We have some dessert. Uh, you can have a glass of wine as well. 
Uh, and we also have Richard Norton Smith, who's agreed to uh, sign book. Books are out in the lobby, and he's uh, willing to sign them. So we hope you can linger and ask more questions. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.